It's not very often here on the WDW News Today podcast that we have a, a interview, um, but we always make a few special um, exceptions to that rule, and uh, tonight is certainly one of those occasions. Uh, with me this evening, I have the former director of entertainment and show development for Disney, and a co-creator of the well-known Main Street Electrical Parade, Mr. Ron Miziker. Thank you very much, Ron, for taking the time to talk with us. Oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. So, uh, Ron, let's get right into it. Um, how did you get your start with the Walt Disney Company? Well, it's kind of an interesting story. I was uh, Actually, I was producing a um, daily television talk show in uh, Cincinnati called the WW, or excuse me, called the, uh, it, was, uh, it was called the 50-50 Club. And um, it was a very popular show syndicated around the Midwest. Uh, it had a 12-piece orchestra. It was on five days a week, 90 minutes. It was like a daytime uh, tonight show, if you will. Okay. And um, we used to have all the leading celebrities on and everybody that was selling books and that sort of thing. And, of course, Disney used to come through with their characters when they used to re-release a uh, movie. Mm-hmm. And I sort of got... To uh, sort of hit it off with the vice president of, uh, of marketing at the time uh, for Disney, and after a couple of visits through the the show, we went to lunch one day, and in conversation, I said, "Gee, I'm really anxious to get back to California, where uh, you know I've gone to the school at SC and so forth, and and uh, I said, I really don't like it here in Cincinnati. So can you give me a job at Disney?" And, and uh, he said, "Well, I don't know. Let me look around and see what." What, what we can do. And uh, I said, okay. So, you know, a week or two went by, and uh, uh, I called him a couple times, and then one day he called me. And uh, he said, Ron, he said, I don't have a uh, position for you in television or in our film group. But he said, we're starting this new uh, live production called Disney on Parade uh, that's going to tour arenas. And the producer of that show needs someone like you to be his assistant. Would you be interested in that job? And I said, hey, sounds like fun to me. <clears throat> so um, I accepted the job. And that was the first Disney on Parade. It was actually rehearsed in Long Beach. It was a huge show. Uh, when it left Long Beach to go to its premier opening in Chicago, we had 60 semis worth of equipment that we were moving. And... The show opened in Chicago, and there was like a gap in booking between that and New York, and there was like two or three weeks in between, and uh, I was going to Madison Square Garden uh, next uh, in in New York, and the cast went on strike, and it it was decided by the powers to be that, okay, we're just going to hire and train a new cast in two weeks and reopen the show with a new cast. And we're not going to get into this, uh, you know, union business, right? <laughs> so uh, that's what they, that they started to do. And, and in the meantime, about, uh, uh, about three or four days before it opened the Madison Square Garden, they actually hung the show, uh, getting it ready for, uh, for the new cast to come into it. Well, after the show was hung, um, thugs in New York, I can't name who they might be, <laughs> but they came in and destroyed the entire show. They cut all the lines that were supporting lights and other equipment uh, in the, from the ceiling and crashed it all down to the ground. They beat up the crew that was there. The, the, stage, the touring stage manager was there, happened to be there. He tried to stop some of them, and he ended up at the hospital for about two years. He, he, he got beat up so badly. Wow. So anyway, the show was uh, an absolute disaster at that point, and 
the fellow who was the producer of the show, who was a person, person I would end up working a lot of years with at Disney, his name was Bob Yanni, and uh, he said, Ron, he said, this is a disaster. And he said, I've got to deal with this. He said, but at the same time, he said, uh, it's not, I'm supposed to be planning the, the, uh, all the shows and entertainment for Walt Disney World. And uh, that was like a year and a half before the opening of Disney World. And uh, he said, would you like to do that? And I said, sounds like fun to me. So I, uh, was, I took on that assignment. And so that was really my first foray into theme park um, entertainment. And uh, I did follow through with all the design and everything, and then actually produced the opening uh, event uh, at Disney World, which was actually a three-day opening. Wow. Um, we had... Uh, first night, uh, no, it was the second night we had the World Symphony Orchestra that we put together with uh, musicians from all over the world. Uh, Arthur Fiedler was the conductor uh, of it, and it was set in front of the castle. Gorgeous evening. And of course, then we had uh, the next story. The first night, we had a luau and all kinds of other activities that uh, for all the VIPs and the corporation executives that were involved with Disney at the time and so forth. Then, of course, the third day was the big opening with the big celebration on Main Street and the television show and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was the opening of Walt Disney World. So you, basically your experience was in studio production and somehow you got moved into this live entertainment show for Disney and then from that somehow ended up in theme park entertainment. Right. Yeah, and then after, um, after Disney World opened, I was made uh, director of show development for Disneyland, Disney World, and uh, eventually Tokyo Disneyland, which came along a few years later. My job was to create all the new shows and open them, and then the operating staff would continue to run them and maintain them and so forth. Okay. So uh, around this time, is where did the, exactly did the idea for, um, because we have to talk about it a whole bunch, it, it's one of those things that is quintessentially Disney. It's the Main Street Electrical Parade. And of course it debuted at, Gis at Disneyland in the summer of 1972. That's that's not very long after you got the job as both uh, in charge of entertainment at Disney World and Disneyland. So where exactly did that idea begin and how exactly did that whole process, uh, how did that go, the, the creation of the Main Street Electrical Parade from, you know, just a, f you know, a little over, what was it, two years on the job at that point? Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I, what happened was, uh, when I, I never lived in Florida, I was just there, I was transferred with my family on a temporary uh, basis for the opening, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the opening. And uh, when, I, when I came back to Los Angeles, um, it was shortly, a couple months later, that the same person who originally hired me, Card Walker, became president of the company. Um, he uh, called... Uh, Myself and Bob Yanni, who now had been relieved of duties of the uh, of the touring show because that had gotten all squared away, and they, they put a touring staff on it that went on the road and so forth with the, with the show. So anyway, he uh, he he said to us, "We got to do something here at Disneyland." He said, "It's it's you know all the news and the press and everything is towards Disney World, and poor little Disneyland is going to suffer. <laughs> so we need to, to come up with something that." will be a strong marketing device for the park. And he said, and he said, we really need to do something at nighttime because just the fireworks alone was not strong enough to hold the people in, in the park. Um, they could still see that, you know, come six o'clock, six o'clock, six thirty, everybody would, would, would leave or a good number of the people anyway. So he said, we got to come, come up with some kind of a nighttime attraction. So we went back, and we, Bob and I, and we scratched our heads and tried to figure out what we could come up with. And in those days, we didn't have the Internet, of course. So I actually went down to the Anaheim Library, and I started going through periodicals and so forth. And I came upon this interesting article uh, that I had until just a few years ago. And somehow I misplaced it. Anyway, it was about... Um, how at the turn of the 20th century, when electricity was kind of still a new thing, in some of the major cities, uh, people would string light bulbs on long extension cords and do little parades down their uh, street with it. And uh, because it was such a novel, novel thing. 
And so I came back with that little article and I showed it to Bob and we said, an electrical parade, isn't that interesting? Now you have to remember that we, for the opening of Disney World, one of the things that we created was a, uh, uh, a uh, water pageant parade that takes place on the Bay Lake uh, next to, uh, you know, out, out next to Disney World, uh, the, between the Magic Kingdom and the Polynesian Resort, the Contemporary Resort, and so forth. Yeah. And it's made up of flat screens uh, on barges, and the screens have the light flash, and they have different animations, very simple animations, and so forth. And we used that as for when we did the giant luau, uh, for one of the, which was one of the opening nights of, of the park. We had that come across the sea with all kinds of pyro effects and other things on it as, as well as kind of a grand finale to that luau. And uh, so we sort of blended that idea with, okay, let's take, you know, lots of, that those happened to be sea creatures that were, that were used. Yeah. We said, well, let's take, you know, the standard characters and the character units and let's see what we can do with lights with with those. So we contracted a designer, uh, Ken Dresser, who uh, we brought in to actually start laying out some concepts and ideas and so forth as to what what we could come up with. And uh, everything went really well. We made this big presentation to Card Walker and to other executives at Disney, and they thought the idea was absolutely fascinating. And uh, so they said, well, let's do it. And but then somebody asked the question, well, how are we going to power these units? Mm -hmm. That became the big challenge. Um, we couldn't use generators because you can't use generators in confined quarters like in the middle of the, of, of the park. Plus they're noisy and smelly and, and, and so forth. Uh, we, we were assigned an engineer whose name was Jerry Hefferly uh, from, from the Disneyland Maintenance Department to work with us, and he kept trying to do what he could with batteries. When we start calculating the loads and how many batteries it would take and everything, it was just overwhelming. Um, and we just couldn't find, you know, we talked about all kinds of things like, you know, well, maybe we could take, you know, the, the trolley tracks that run down the street. Maybe we can electrify those and, you know, all, all kinds of silly yeah. ideas. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it, it, was, uh, it was a really interesting, but it was a fight, and we, we were really hitting dead ends everywhere. We, we turned. Finally, we, we were getting down in time, and uh, Dick Nunes was the man who was you know, the vice president who was responsible for all park operations, and he really didn't feel it was necessary to have uh, this nighttime attraction because they were opening Bear Band that summer, and he felt that the Bear Band would be strong enough to, to, to draw the audience. But mm -hmm. Card insisted, we've got to have something. So he said, Mizzaker, you've got two weeks to come up with a solution to this problem, uh, this wow. powering problem. And so, you know, Jerry and I, we went off and we talked with other engineers and we tried to figure out what, what we were going to do. Well, about three days before the deadline, I got a call at midnight or so in the evening at home. And it was Jerry and he said, Ron, I've been doing all these calculations and I know how we can do this now. He said, they've actually just come out with new batteries called nickel cadmium batteries. And he said, they're much stronger and smaller and lighter, and they have a much longer life uh, than, than the traditional old car batteries. So he said, I think we can, he said, they use them now. He said, the studio just got some of them for, for uh, lighting uh, purposes and so forth. And he said, I tested it. And I think we can do it. And I said, when will you have your numbers ready? And he said, I've been working on them all evening. He said, I'll have them ready tomorrow. So we met the next day, and we went through all the units that we had in the float and determined how many batteries. Now, we really needed, you know, um, and, and we, were, we were a little bit fortunate at that point because our designs, not many people know it, but the first edition of the electrical parade, a lot of the elements were flat. Mm -hmm. Just like the screens at Walt Disney World uh, on the barges. Um, basically, they had lights on both sides of them, but they were a flat image. Um, and, 
and they were actually pulled by cast members in costume uh, with a little pull bar and sticking out in front of the unit. Mm -hmm. So, because you've got three power demands. One is uh, the lights themselves. The second is uh, uh, the the uh, sound system that we wanted to have on the floats. And the third is power units that would drive a, a float along. So you end up with a mass of batteries. Well, with our calculations, we figured that we could we could make it through the park one way, but then the batteries would have to go on recharge uh, before they made a second power pass back through the park later in the evening. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was all calculated out and so forth. So, sure enough, Card called and said, okay, we're meeting tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Be there. Tell me how you're going to solve the problem. So I was there. Jerry was there. Bob Gani was there. Uh, Nunes was there. And I said, I'm happy to report we came up with a solution to the problem. And we went in and we explained how it was going to work and how many batteries. We had it all charted out and, and everything. And it, everybody became very ecstatic. They said, let's go for it. Um, so that was the start. So the, but that was only the start of the problems because we determined that we wanted to use the little tiny light bulbs, you know, little Christmas lights. Mm -hmm. But at the time, those were really rare. In fact, there was only one company that made them. It was an Italian company called Silvestri. And they had an office in Chicago because they would do the lights on the trees and everything on, uh, uh, what's downtown Chicago, what's the name of the street, uh, whatever it is, uh, at Christmas time. And the Japanese and other Koreans and Chinese or whatever didn't make these lights at, at, at that time. It was only these uh, Italian lights. And they only came in white or in clear. So you actually had to paint each light bulb the color that you wanted to, 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 it to be. So anyway, um, so I went back and we met with this company, Silvestri, and we made a contract with them to actually figure in we utilize their expertise and we would have them build all of the float units mm -hmm. for us and put all the lights on. And um, it was an extensive contract, and uh, but by this time, you know, we're now getting down on time because it was supposed to open, what, June 15th or something, I don't remember the exact date. And uh, we were only a few months away from 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 that. And, uh, but they agreed that they would do it. So they started and went to work. We gave them the money. They began and worked and worked and worked. I kept calling and checking and everything. I kept saying, yeah, 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 things are coming along well. Well, finally, I was beginning to smell, you know, kind of a, a bad smell about what was going on in Chicago. So I went back and I found that they really hadn't done a lot. I mean, they, they had done a lot, but they still hadn't done a lot. It was a bunch of pieces of stuff. The wiring was every which way. Uh, nothing was complete. And here we are like a month and a half before opening. Wow. <laughs> I, I swear, uh, you know, I, I, I was just flabbergasted. We couldn't, couldn't figure out, yeah, what am I going to do? So I called Bob Yanni and I said, Bob, it's a disaster here. I said, uh, it's, it's never going to happen. These people will never get it together for us. And um, so we talked about options. We decided that what we would do is move everything that did exist to California and finish it in California. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we decided that what we would do is we, we um, and we worked with the, the, uh, the group from the maintenance department at uh, Disneyland who were really heroes in this whole thing. And what we did was we put up a, a great big circus tent out in the back area I was in Chicago loading all the pieces onto moving vans, um, and I remember flying back from Chicago to to California, thinking I had 14 moving vans on the road under me as I was flying back, <laughs> <laughs> carrying all the stuff <laughs> that had been done, uh, but it was going to be held to get it all finished, and it was. But I tell you, they. Uh, the, the maintenance group, they hired a bunch of electricians and carpenters and 
all sorts of other types of individuals. We basically work 24 hours uh, in, in shifts uh, and completely put the parade together in about a month and a half period of time. Wow. It was so close that uh, we, when we had all these rehearsals scheduled with the cast and we had electrical light costumes and all that sort of thing. And um, we had three rehearsals scheduled. Well, we canceled the first two uh, because um, things just were not far enough along and we figured the hours that it would take to do the rehearsal by the time we put everything together, put the batteries in, put it out into position, did the rehearsal, came back, the amount of time that we would lose was just impossible to lose. So uh, we canceled two of the rehearsals. The third one we had to do, we just figured we had to do one rehearsal. Well, it turned out that rehearsal was a disaster. Things were falling apart and breaking. The cast was getting shocked. And, uh, wow. <laughs> it was an absolute nightmare. Absolute nightmare. So this is like two nights before the, it's going to open, right? Mm -hmm. So we brought everything back, and our choreographer team, they really worked with the cast, and now that everybody had saw everything, and... Um, so, you know, at least they had felt it and saw it, and so they worked with that and rehearsed them without any of the equipment a few more times. In the meantime, our crews continued to put everything together and back together in some cases. And I can tell you, um, the night of the premiere, um, Bob and I were standing behind the gate on Main Street with everything lined up, ready to go out, and we had never turned it all on. Um, oh, wow. Never had turned it all on. And Jerry, the engineer, calculated that we only had enough charge on the batteries to get through Town Square and Main Street, and uh, and then they would begin to fade uh, after it got that. But we didn't care because all the press and everybody was in, in, in uh, Town Square, right? <laughs> so these electricians that we are were just miracle men. I mean, they, got, they so got into this thing. I mean, they didn't take meal breaks or anything and it was so amazing I, I still have this image in my mind it's the gates you know the music started and the gates swung open and the blue fairies start going out and all the rest of the parade elements start going out the gate and as it, each unit got to the to the gate it was like it was like you know rats jumping a ship you know all the electricians and, and people were jumping off of the units. <laughs> That's the last, and they were working right down to the very last minute before they went out the gate. Wow. <laughs> but it, uh, fortunately, it was a, a big success. And, and, uh, and then, you know, it was, what, two or three years later that we actually did the first big revision of the parade where we converted everything to three dimension and so forth. So wow. that's the story of the start of the electrical parade. It's amazing that that late, you know, working on them until they're actually at the gate about to go out and be seen for the first time by guests. Really unbelievable. I don't think you'll see that anymore today. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when you have a, you know, when a show has a deadline and has to open at a certain time, you open. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so one thing I wanted to talk about was the music a bit, and not only just the, the soundtrack, but the technology behind the, the music system. Now, I'm not sure if it debuted with the first version or it was that updated version, but was this not the first parade to use that technology where today, um, when a guest is standing on Main Street USA, the audio from each individual float is, is what they hear, you know, both piped in and from the float itself? Yeah, we. Um, it was from the first parade that we, 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 we did that. Um, um, and that was another element that we really wanted. You know, we, you know uh, before that we had redone the Christmas parade um, uh, for for uh, Disney World, and we really that was the first parade in which we really made it what we call a show parade um, out of it. It had been at Disneyland for a number of years, but we made a whole new version of it for for um, that first Christmas at at uh, Disney World. Mm -hmm. And the reason we did is because, you know, uh, we were hiring, you know, big name entertainers and so forth to perform at the park, but they would only do, you know, two performances a night. 
Yeah. And our biggest facility held like uh, 5,000 people. So that's 10,000 people that would see the performer, and they were very expensive. And, and you know, you either like a certain group or you don't like a certain group, you know? Mm-hmm. But again, when you've got a, a part day of, you know, 60,000 people, and you're only entertaining 10 of them, you know, that's not a very wise expenditure of the money. Mm-hmm. So, again, you know, um, I talked about, I brought up examples to everybody about how, you know, shows used to be moving stages. If you recall, each act was a different stage, used to roll by in wagons back mm-hmm. in medieval times and so forth, you know. So I said, why don't we make the parade our show and make that the focus of why people come to the park? And everybody really got into it. When we got to the electrical parade, it was the first chance to really take advantage of the sound because typically you have sound on the units, but you've got gaps and you, and you lose the energy and the excitement and everything. So I really yeah. felt it was really important to have this constant envelope of sound, no matter where you were standing um, on the freight route. Mm-hmm. So that's what we came up with, and obviously we put the speakers along the the, the building, uh, you know, along the parade route that would be the support and carry the basic theme, and then the units on the floats themselves, the sound units, would carry the theme of that particular uh, unit. And of course, that music had to be written to fit against the background music that was that was playing. Um, at the time, nobody had ever done anything like this, so it took a lot of uh, uh, good people uh, to, to make it all happen, uh, both on the music side and on the uh, audio engineering side of, of, of the project. Um, you know, the other thing we had to do, which sounds is off of the sound for a moment, but we, we wanted all the lights to dim on Main Street and along the park route uh, yeah. as the parade started. And of course, they weren't fixed to do that. So the whole, all the lights along the parade route had to be rewired back to one control point. So it was quite an effort. Wow. And an expense. Um, so anyway, then with, with the music, the other thing is that, you know, we felt that people should have, uh, they should see the start of the parade when it gets to them. So we took the parade route and we broke it into seven zones. Mm-hmm. So that the parade would actually start in zone one with the opening announcement and fanfare and all that sort of thing. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you know, that voice bit that we use. And it would then, and as it was doing that in zone one and zone six and seven down the route, it was telling the people that there were announcements going, the parade is starting in Main Street, you know, over in Town Square to be here in about 15, 20 minutes, blah, 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 blah. And then as the, as the first units went through Zone 1, which was Town Square, they would then go into uh, Main Street, um, and, and, and again, it would start over again as it entered Zone 2, with the opening announcement and the whole thing. And that was repeated the seven times in the seven zones. So you had, it was very complicated because in the zone, when the parade finally got to the last zone, Zone 7, well, Zone 6 was carrying the second phase of that. Zone 5 was carrying the third phase and so forth, all the way back up the line. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it worked very effectively because each group of people felt that they were at the start of the parade. Yeah, and the audio, of course, would, would follow. And, of course, each float you would get that individual, as you said, like stage experience for the Alice section. You would get the Alice in Wonderland music and so on and so forth. Right, right, right. Um, well, we, we talked a bit about how the, the music managed to play, um, but the music itself itself is, is considered classic Disney uh, by anyone that's ever seen the Electrical Parade. Uh, the theme song that you hear in the beginning of the parade and at the very, very end, Bro Down. how did that choice come to be? Where did, where did that song come from? Well, we, uh, one of the members of my, of my development team, I had a, a great team of people in those days, and one was uh, by the name of Jack Wagner, and we had just, uh, one of the things that we did for the opening of Disney World is we picked all the background music that plays in the restaurants and on Main Street and, and so forth all over the park. 
and he was very good at going out and finding samples of music, and, and we would select the sample that we like and, and make it for that particular area uh, of, of the park. So when it came time for the electrical parade, we said, we need some kind of special music. Uh, Bob Yanni was, he really wanted to have calliope uh, music, and he had found this giant calliope machine uh, somewhere uh, that could be programmed to to produce all this music. Well, myself and the musical directors really felt that, you know, at that point, electronic music was just beginning to, to come about. And one of the samples that Jack had brought in was this electronic song, which was called Baroque Hoedown. And instantly we all loved it, and we thought, Electrical music for an electrical parade is an absolute must. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's that's where you gotta be, right? Yep. So we we um, uh, but the challenge was how do you create all the different pieces? You know, the Snow White theme and the Alice in Wonderland theme and all that. So we found this uh, guy who was really in, uh, a, a, a leader in electrical music, and and uh, his name was Paul Beaver, and he had one whole room of his house filled with all these racks of electronic equipment and he could actually create the sound one line of music at a time of, of these various uh, other uh, themes that we wanted to incorporate in the parade. Mm -hmm. So then we contacted the people that had the song broke hold, hold down uh, who wrote it and we made a deal with them we bought the rights to the song and you know, everybody thinks it was a Disney creation, but it wasn't. It was written by two guys. Their last names were Perry and Kingsley. And uh, they actually created that song. We happened to find it. We adapted it. We bought it from them. And then we recreated all the other themes to match that musical feel. And, of course, it, again, as I said before, really become instant classic Disney music. It's funny, it's not actually a Disney song, yet it, it is most commonly considered a Disney song by anyone that's ever seen the parade. Well, it is now because Disney owns it. But <laughs> They own it now. <laughs> <laughs> They've owned it for a long time. <laughs> yeah. So were, were you at all surprised by the initial success in, in 72 when this thing first rolled out on Main Street? I was uh, actually overwhelmed by the audience response to it. Um, and I, I, I got to tell you, I, I was... I was invited back when they took it out 25 years later, the last time it was going to perform at Disneyland. They invited um, myself and other members of the, the original team of people that worked on the parade. And they had a special VIP area for us in Town Square. And I got to tell you, it was one of the emotional, most emotional nights I've ever, I've ever seen because first, the crowds were huge for the weeks before the, the, the parade ended. They set all kinds of attendance records. And the night I was there, people had all these signs and everything. We love you. Don't go away. You know, oh, they, it was just, and they were all waving them and yelling and hollering and cheering, uh, waiting for the parade to start. And then when it started, uh, the, 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 group, the the parade would came into Town Square where, where we were, and it would... Uh, Members of the cast of the parade would do a little bow to us that were standing on the side there in the VIP area, and then they'd move on. It was so nice, and the crowd was just screaming. They were just so <laughs> excited. It was absolutely a wonderful, and, and you know, and, and that was a wonderful climax. But I can't tell you how many times I stood on the street, whether it was at Disneyland or Disney World, um, and watched the reaction of the audience to that. Parade, and I was always moved by it. So, so you were you were brought back for the the 25th anniversary when they um, that was 1996, the farewell, the original farewell of the parade, right? That was no, that was the final farewell of the parade. Okay, and I'm just so not sure what that was. Yeah, maybe it was 96. 90, I don't know. I can't remember. Okay, but um, so obviously that was 1996, and here we are in, in 2010, and the parade, you know, even though there was all these farewells in, in California and Florida, the parade still exists, and, and you said you're already surprised by how much uh, the initial 
you know, guest response, what that was like. And then, you know, 25 years later to still be like that. And now even further down the line, another, you know, 14 years after that, the parade is still performing. And um, did you ever think when you were creating it back then or even 25 years after that, that it, it would still be in the parks today? No, we, we created with the idea that it was going to run for two years. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> Got quite an extension. <laughs> quite an extension. <laughs> and, you know, I'll be a, a bit selfish, too. I, I, I have to say that, you know, the, uh, the parks always do exit surveys of guests leaving the park, and they ask questions of what they enjoyed most and least and so forth. And for years, the number one most enjoyed uh, show at all the parks was the, the electrical parade. Uh, I mean, this is a, over Pirates of the Caribbean and Small World and all yeah. the other uh, famous uh, A lot of competition. Uh, parks. Uh, yeah, there was a lot, of com- a lot of very good competition, you know. So I was always very proud of that as well. Now, um, you said you worked on the the second version of the parade that debuted at Disneyland. Now, how how many different versions of the parade did you oversee? Just the Disneyland? Uh, Did you work on the Disney World version? Well, we, we, yeah, we, what what happened is like uh, with with all of our projects, we wouldn't, you know, we we would have the same menu. So that meant if we made one of something, we'd usually make two or three of it, depending on how many parks it was going to. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, when we revised the parade the first time, um, that's when we actually went to Disney World for the first time, but also the same, you know, the second version of it also opened at Disneyland. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I went through the third rehab um, of it as well. Um, and again, that went to, you know, when it was completely redone, it went to Disneyland, Disney World, Tokyo Disneyland at that time. Mm-hmm. And it's funny that they were doing that back in the 70s, because today you often hear um, when they open something at both Disneyland and Disney World or at the multiple resorts around the world, some people claim, you know, oh, it's modern day synergy. But they were really doing that way back in, in the 1970s, really starting, you know, oh, yeah. as soon as Disney World oh, opened. Yeah. yeah. Many of our shows, we would, you know, would plan two of or three of, depending on what it was. So uh, we talked about Disney World a lot. We've talked about the Main Street Electric Parade. Uh, you you worked on a lot of stuff, as you said. When before Walt Disney World opened, you were put in the position of being in charge of the entertainment for Walt Disney World. And there's three things uh, from, or three or four things from that early days that, that really stick out when you look at the the list of opening entertainment. Uh, obviously, the Hoop Dee Doo Review, which is still performing, uh, the Polynesian Luau in in some form still performing today. Of course, the Top of the World Club no longer at Contemporary, but those two shows still performing, and as well. Um, remembering in Frontierland, the Diamond Horseshoe Saloon Review. You have any memories about any of those shows? Yeah, well, of course. The Diamond Horseshoe was a, pretty much a straight uh, duplicate of the one that was, uh, you know, the, the, the Golden Horseshoe at Disneyland. So that was uh, pretty much a straight uh, copy. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that's a show that Walt actually built or oversaw the, originally when when they opened Disneyland. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, the. The Luau was an early show because, again, as I mentioned, uh, we did this giant Luau on the beach for the as one of the opening night dinners uh, for for the, for Walt Disney World with with uh, with the whole, you know electrical water pageant on the water, hundreds of Polynesian dancers all coming in on barges and boats of different types and all that. It was in all kinds of fire effects and of course pyro and fireworks and all sorts of things. It was so anyway. It, it, it was such a hit on the beach that we decided that we needed, and, and this was working with the hotel people, we decided that it'd be great to keep it as a every night dinner show on the beach. Well, soon, you know, we realized that people don't like to sit in the sand. That's what it was originally, with the low table sitting in the sand. So we designed the uh, facility, uh, with a, and also would get rained out on a lot of nights, you know. Mm-hmm. So we designed a facility that... Uh, uh, it's currently there, which um, is, has a roof. You know, if you sit at a real table, uh, people are much more comfortable. It's got a great stage and an environment. And I, I've got to say that the show that that's there was there for many years. Uh, it's probably the best luau in the world. Uh, we we incorporate a lot of very special effects and numbers in it. Um, and one of the things I brought into it was the menahunis, which are the puppets. Uh, 
know, the spirit and the, 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 the little spirits that live in the ponds in Kauai, um, uh, we, we created those as puppets. And we use that as a number in the show, which really, the young people, of course, really, really uh, enjoyed. And the Hawaiian wedding song with uh, all the intertwining of these vines and everything, these uh, flower lays, uh, the way it was staged, was absolutely brilliant, I think. I didn't do it. I mean, I oversaw it, but our, mm -hmm. our team of, of uh, choreographers working with some of the best um, uh, from uh, Hawaii, uh, really created quite a show. Like I said, it was by far the, and, and I've seen most of the, the Hawaiian shows in, uh, in, in, in Hawaii, and I'll tell you, ours was just really fantastic. Um, Top of the World was an interesting issue because it was felt that uh, we needed a, a, you know, an elegant uh, experience where people could dress up and have an eloquent, eloquent uh evening so mm -hmm. we created basically uh, a bandstand a modern uh, bandstand and we had a the person who we had in uh, there nightly conducting the orchestra was uh, an ex big band uh, person himself and it was very special because here you are up on the top of the world with uh, this beautiful view out um, and this uh, big band uh, very elegant very different than going to the Luau or going to the Magic Kingdom, but it was a, a very welcome change for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. The Hoop to Do was a different kind of an experience. Um, it came later, I think it opened in like 78 or something, I can't remember exactly, but they finished uh, the Fort Wilderness campground and they wanted to build a structure there and the uh, Imagineering group really wanted to make it a place for, um, you know, nature movies and uh, nature talks and things like that. Well, at that point, um, there was a real push on in the company to generate revenue from a lot of different sources. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so we... We won that battle by saying, look, we could take this hall that you have designed and turn it into a dinner show. And they said, well, what kind of dinner show could it be? And they said, well, it'd be a Western country kind of dinner show. And uh, they said, uh, okay, let's do it. Uh, of course, the Imagineers didn't like that so well because you know, so they had all these huge pillars and things in there, and we said, you got to get them out. got to have sight lines <laughs> on the stage, you know. Um, but it's still an exquisite building. If you've been in it, you know it's a, it's a really an attractive uh, building inside. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I went to work with my team on creating the show. Um, I, I uh, contracted a fellow by the name of Tom Adair uh, to do the music for the show. Uh, Tom is really an interesting character. Um, and he really was a, a wonderful character, but a character. And <laughs> he, uh, he wrote all the songs for the Mickey Mouse Club originally. You know, Talent Roundup Rodeo and uh, Mickey, he, he wrote M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-E. <laughs> uh, he wrote all those songs. And he was... He had a permanent job at the studio, but he didn't have anything to do, so I convinced their way to let him come and work for us and, and do lyrics and music for this show. And he did a, a, a great job with it. And uh, as, as you know, people still sit there and sing along and have bang along and have a good time. Um, originally, we cast that show with... We, we, we started a, a, a college... Uh, program whereby talented young performers in college could come to work for Disneyland, Disney World, and they'd work for the summer and, um, and then go back to school, but they would get mm -hmm. this professional experience. And of course, we got them at a real bargain price, you know? Yeah. So it was good for us. And uh, anyway, so we hired students to do the first show there. Uh, 
Many of them stayed on for years. <laughs> Never went back to school. <laughs> uh, and two of them are big producers in the industry uh, today uh, themselves. Uh, so uh, it, it, it was quite an experience right from the beginning. The show uh, it was one of those that really hit the audience right on. Uh, everybody had a great time, and uh, and again, it was the run for a few years, and it's been running for what thirty years. Yeah, and they, you've uh, you've had a tremendous they, amount of luck with with what you've created. I mean, in in my in the twenty something years I've been going to the parks, I've seen hundreds and thousands of shows come and go, and your shows have have really stood the test of time. <laughs> That's uh, I, 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 I'm lucky, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so. Anyway, uh, coming to late, uh, late, later seventies, I, 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 I just said to myself, I don't think I can do the Mickey Mouse march one more time. You know, I've got to, I got to look around and see what else I can do. And of course, I, I had been badgering uh, Ron Miller, who was uh, also a president of the company, and before mm-hmm. him, Don Tatum, and so forth. And I want to get back into television. That's where I started in television. I want to get back into television. I know I can do some good things at the studio. <laughs> so, but I, yeah, I think it's the old story. Of, you know, they, they felt I was valuable where, where I was, and they didn't want to necessarily, you know, change things, you know? Yeah. Uh, so one day I just said, I'm leaving. Uh, I'm going to go out and produce television. So I did. Um, I ended up producing uh, several uh you know, primetime television specials, uh, several of the Perry Como uh, Christmas shows and Easter shows, uh, which at that time we were getting like a 45 share with with those shows, which is huge. You know, that even the Super Bowl, I think I just read this last Super Bowl was, was the first time they got very close to that. I think they got a 43 or 44 share. Wow. Wow. Um, but, you know, obviously that means almost half of the sets that are on in the United States are watching your show. Yeah. You know? So uh, it's a huge rating, and that's what we were generating with the shows. And I was so it was I was actually doing very well with them. And one day I got a call from uh, one of the vice presidents at the studio, and he said, "Ron said Ron Miller wants to talk to you." Ron Miller was president at the time, and he said, "Will you come on over?" I said, "Sure." So I went over, and to my surprise, he offered me a job <laughs> at the studio. <laughs> doing television specials, primetime specials. So uh, I said, you know, I've always loved this company. Uh, I've loved being a part of what it's been. Sure, I'd love to do this. So uh, I came aboard and and uh, did that. Um, and uh, had a great time doing it because uh, most of the shows we did were shot on location. Some were shot in the studio, but most were shot on location. We had great talent, stars, everybody from... Like I said, the the Mouseketeers to uh, Michael Jackson, you know, uh, mm-hmm. were on the shows. So uh, it was a a, a great uh, a, a great time. And then uh, one day, um, I was called into Ron Miller's office again. He said, "Mizzaker, I'm changing what you're doing." And I said, "What? What are you changing?" He said, "We've decided that we're going to go ahead and do the the Disney Channel." cable channel mm-hmm. and he said you're the only person in this company who knows videotape production so you're going to be responsible for all the new shows for the for the channel I said why do I want to go do cable when I'm doing prime time network specials you yeah know? this is cable <laughs> cables in its infancy at this point yeah cables in its infancy yeah exactly. and you're, you're doing a 45 share and he wants you to go to cable <laughs> yeah, And he said, he said, well, you don't have any choice. He said, uh, you, you're going to go do it. And I said, well, let's make a deal. So I actually made a deal with him. I said, all right, I'll go do it for a year and get the channel off and going. But then I want to come back and do what I'm doing here. Mm-hmm. And he said, okay, I'll make that deal with you. So we shook hands and, and uh, I went off to the Disney Channel. And the Disney Channel was really a lot of fun. I mean, uh, we did uh, so many different shows. Uh, at the time, uh, the the concept was to 
use one third of the programming would be from the Disney library. Mm -hmm. One third would be acquisition or things we bought from other people. Mm -hmm. And one third would be original programs. And um, so it was a lot of programming that we needed. And I eventually ended up doing about 500 hours of shows. Um, wow. But uh, and it was everything from, you know, Mouser Size uh, in those yeah. days. To... <laughs> I remember Mouser Size very well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a shame that you remember that. <laughs> I actually have the I actually have the VHS. I just put it in about a year ago, and and uh, my family and I really really enjoyed looking back at that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, and 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 too, uh, we did uh, we did uh, actually the you know the the most aggressive uh, film series for the channel called it was a series called Five Mile Creek. Mm -hmm. um, that had ever been done for cable. We it was we started out with a two hour movie of Five Mile Creek, and then we ended up doing I think it was about thirty six episodes, uh, hour episodes uh, of it to follow after the movie. And it was all shot in Australia. Uh, it was it was a you know really good budget. Uh, and this is show. original programming for cable television. That's fairly new at the time, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Nobody else was doing that sort of thing, you know. So. Uh, so it, it really diversified my portfolio because all the all the different types of, of, of show projects that that um, we were doing for the channel. Mm -hmm. And then anyway, the year goes by and I am still having a good time. And by another year goes by and <laughs> uh, I remind Ron Miller that uh, you know we had a deal and I'm ready now to come back to to uh, to uh, the studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, Ron, he says, I, I just can't do that right now. He says, I, I, you're, you're, you're probably find out later why. But what I didn't know is that he was being fired. And mm -hmm. uh, Eisner was coming in to take over the studio. Yeah. So anyway, in that, in that interim time, um, I sat down with him. I said, okay, what I'd like to do is negotiate a, a production deal where I can continue to produce shows uh, in my own company for the channel. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, that sounds good. And so we negotiated a contract, and um, I hung out my shingle and started my own company, producing shows for the Disney Channel. And what, what years were you in, in that, um, well, you were in that position at Disney Channel, what years? I think it was 80, 81, 82, 83, something like that. Okay, so very, very, just the early formative years. Mm-hmm. And then you, then your individual, your separate company, that's the um, Musica Entertainment Group, right? Right. And for that group, what exactly did you, your group produce for, for Disney Channel? Well, it was, it was, it was kind of interesting. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, fate works in a strange way, I guess. But, you know, um, I know Center signed a deal and we started working on one series. Uh, actually, it was a a series to shoot at the park. It was called Big Dance at Disneyland. You know, they used to have the big dance at Disneyland every mm -hmm. year. Yeah. All the famous old dance. And, and so we actually shot those and made a series out of it. But well, we were starting to do that. And, and this is only, you know, like three months after, um, after I left the company. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I forgot to mention is when I was at Disney in that position of show development, we were, Disney was also called on to do a lot of different things, be it the Olympics, uh, big events in different places all over, and of course those, you know, uh, Orange Bowl halftime shows, uh, Super Bowl halftimes, all that stuff. And those, they came, you know, that was my responsibility as well. And uh, so I, so no sooner had I, I got out of uh, Disney and we started working on this one series and preparing other uh, series. When I uh, got a call from some friends in Washington who said that they wanted to have a meeting with me uh, in Washington, D.C., and I said, what about? And they said, we want you to do this big event. And I said, what a big event? I said, it's for the Sultan of Oman in Muscat, Oman. I said, what? And he said, yep. And you have to go there this weekend to meet with them. And I said, go where? And they said, to Oman. I said, I'm going to go to Oman this weekend? <laughs> 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 to meet with who? He said, with the Sultan. <laughs> <laughs> I got on a plane and went to Muscat. 
And uh, at that time, it was a closed country. You know, you had to get all these special permits and all that to get into the to the country. And and uh, you know, and then uh, which was all arranged for me, man. I was you know met at the, met right on board the airplane and uh, escorted you know right over to limousines and taken to a hotel and. And the next morning, uh, I had a meeting with His Majesty in the palace. And uh, we had a nice little chat. He said this was his 15th anniversary celebration. An interesting story. He, uh, um, so this would be, let me see, 85, I guess, about 85 or 84, late 84, 85. And uh, he said to me, well, actually, somebody else told me before before I actually met him, but they said that what happened was that uh, 15 years before that, so that would be like 1970, right? Yeah. Um, he, uh, the country was a closed country, and people had to, there was no farm machinery, there was no uh, cars, no paved roads, uh, wow. no medical, nobody went to school, Right. Mm-hmm. It was a very primitive country, and his father liked it that way, who was the sultan. And he made one mistake. He sent his son off to get educated. He went to uh, 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 to uh, Oxford and, and then to Sandhurst, the British military school. Mm-hmm. And when he came back in, in 70, he said to his dad, uh, Dad, I'd like to, or it was actually 68, I guess, he said to his dad, um, I'd like to modernize this country. It's time that we do it. And his dad said, well, I don't people... I don't like people that talk like you. So we <laughs> throw them in house arrest for two years. Wow. Right? And during that two years, he organized a coup, and it turned out to be a bloodless coup, and he overthrew his father, sent him off to live in London, a big mansion, and took over the country. And he took that 15 years to be his renaissance period. Mm-hmm. Uh, where he changed the country from what it was to a modern-day country with paved roads, automobiles, open-heart surgery in the hospitals, universities, with everybody going to school, the whole thing, 15 mm-hmm. years, he created this country. And he wanted this celebration that would blow the minds of all of his guests uh, to, you know, to, to commemorate this important event for him and the country. Mm-hmm. So we, so we sat there and we discussed what it should be and so forth, and and um, I, I got some ideas from him and thoughts. I knew I found out that he was uh, he loved all the classics. He liked the most exciting parts of all the classics and all you know and everything. And and of course we talked about fireworks and everything else that we could do. So he said, I want you to go away and come back in uh, three weeks and have a proposal for me of what we could do. So I got back on the airplane. I was I was gone actually, I, I flew from LA to Muscat, had the meeting and was back uh, in three days. I only do that because of the time difference, you know? Mm-hmm. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, he, uh, and we put together a concept. And then I went back again another time and presented the concept to him and he absolutely loved it and um, we executed it. Um, it was a huge celebration. It was about, the, the whole show was really only about um, 17 minutes long, but during that 17 minutes, uh, we, the music was, was done by a 100-piece orchestra. The, the fireworks, we actually used more fireworks in that period of time than they did the entire Statue of Liberty weekend. Um, wow. Um, and I used this French uh, pyrotechnician uh, designer who we synchronized every single shell uh, to match different effects in the music and so forth. And uh, then we had fountains coming up out of the sea to spray in color and water and all that stuff. We had light barges on the sea. Had to go back to those. Um, we had uh, all kinds of other uh, laser and all kinds of visual effects. Um, it was it was a really spectacular. He had uh, 450 guests that night and this big, huge garden party behind the palace. And we did this show on the sea behind behind that. 
And um, out of the 450 guests, uh, he had 45 heads of state there. Wow. So, um, you know, he had all the uh, Arab country leaders, all, you know, so forth. Mm-hmm. So it was really quite a show. And it was made, so suddenly I was, you know, back away from television doing <laughs> 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 they must have said, stuff. "Get that, get that guy that did that electrical parade." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, um, well, really, well, le- reading your your list of credits on um, your website and for the entertainment group, it's really a stunning. And and we feel I felt a little silly talking to you about all the Disney stuff because that's what we do. But a lot of your stuff is just huge Super Bowls and Orange Bowls and World Cup and and just like the story you just told, so many big events like that. Yeah. And then we've also done a large amount of uh, theme park shows and other things we've done, you know. And and it's really kind of fun because every project is different. Uh, for a while, we were doing a lot of television, but now television has gotten very difficult. And mm-hmm. and, uh, and you can't make any money at it as an independent producer, you know. Mm-hmm. So um, we uh, haven't done too much television already. But, you know, the combination of, of live shows, spectacular events, and television is is kept life very uh, interesting yeah so the the entertainment group is still very active in doing um again you said you're sticking mostly to live entertainment right mm-hmm. okay anything re- anything oh, recently that might have caught our eyes let's see no but i i, I uh, we're currently working on a project and a lot of it is foreign you know uh, mm-hmm. so your your audience may not uh know about it um just because, in particularly in the world of theme parks right now, that's where all the whole emphasis is in different parts of the world. You know, yeah, Dubai, and, yeah. Dubai, China. Uh, we we actually just signed a project in China, um, and other places. You know, mm-hmm. but um, and then just because I've always wanted to have my own little dinner show, I actually started one in Arizona called the Howdy Show, which <laughs> is um, it's somewhat a takeoff of the Howdy <laughs> Show. And uh, it's doing fine. We did, we opened it in November, and uh, it's uh, it's doing it's doing well. It's in, uh, it, it, we we found this really neat venue, which was an old western town that was actually built as a a dinner theater. Mm-hmm. And the people that had operated it for twenty five years uh, finally wanted to retire or whatever, so um, we were able to lease the facility from them, and uh, so it, it really fits. Uh, the mood, but this, this is like a show that uh, I based it on. You know the the touring shows that used to go from mining camp to mining camp in the during the gold rush period, mm-hmm. and of course their goal was to suck as much gold out of the miners as they possibly could before they'd move on to the next town and perform to the next group. You mm-hmm. know, and uh, so um, it's got a whole different emphasis. Uh, but um, it, and the reason I did it is because I. You know, it's like, you know, when you go to Hawaii, what do you want to do as a tourist? You want to go to a luau. Mm-hmm. Well, if you go to Arizona and you want to experience the Old West, there really isn't any place you can do that. Uh, so we created our Western luau, which is uh, called the Hoopty Doo Show. Not the Hoopty Doo Show, the Hoopty Show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. But, uh, so where where in Arizona can people check that out if they want to go see that? It's in, it's in Mesa. Okay. And all the Summer information about that, um, can you find on your website? or? Yeah, and, and we have it for that show. It's uh, howdyshow.com, Okay. website. Excellent. So. Um, one more thing I wanted to, I want to go f- kind of full circle here, um, if it's all right with you, and, and go back to the parks for a second. And one particular television special that has stuck with myself and a number of Disney fans for so long. We've probably seen it so many times, many of us can recite it word for word. Uh, that is the Epcot Center grand opening in 1982, which you were the producer for? Yes. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, we, it, um, you know, the challenge there was um, we really wanted to do something live, uh, like the opening of Disneyland was a live television event back in 1955. But the networks, of course, don't like live stuff anymore like that, mm-hmm. uh, particularly music shows and so forth, you know. So... Yeah. It uh, became a real challenge, uh, but we were able to convince them that we should at least open live. So the opening of the show is actually has a live opening right there with all the excitement and fun of 
the the opening of uh, Epcot, and but the rest is a is a pre-taped musical special. And um, it was uh, with Danny Kaye was the host of it, mm-hmm. um, and it was definitely a challenge to to, to work with, but <laughs> um, you know, a very talented talented man, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it. Uh, and, and, and it's also, you know, the, the challenge with those shows was, uh, with all of them, not just the Epcot openings, you, you know, they're really designed, of course, to sell people on coming to Disney World or Disneyland. You yeah, know? you're really given the introduction to these places. This is the first time these people from all around the world are going to yeah. see these places. You have to really sell them um, on these new parks and, and resorts. Yeah, but you have to do it in a way that's subtle and fun, you yeah. know? Um, so um, therein lies the challenge when you're putting the show together um and you know it's always uh i mean the big scene of course was the end where you know uh we had staged up the trumpeters on the rooftops the marching bands the the uh the uh west point glee club the fountains going you know and 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 um you know, the huge crowds in the park and the balloon release and the doves and, yeah. you know, <laughs> all of that stuff happening together. Uh, and uh, it was uh, it was quite memorable. <laughs> you had to be there. <laughs> <laughs> During uh, the taping of it, um, <laughs> I don't know. For some reason, and here's Danny Kaye in the middle up on this platform when he's conducting the masses, right? Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden he drops his pants, right? <laughs> <laughs> and there are thousands of visitors, you know, in the park watching, that, you know, this whole thing, you know? And he oh, drops wow. his pants in front of everybody just to be fun, you know? Wow. Oh, boy. Those are the moments. <laughs> <laughs> I will never forget that now when every time I watch that special now I will think of that <laughs> uh, just one more um, I, I know you worked on, on a lot of entertainment for the parks and just wanted to give you an opportunity maybe there's something that um, has been lost in time or, or something you remember working on that maybe you know the average Disney fan doesn't remember because it was back in the 70s or 80s or it wasn't around that long is there anything you remember any other entertainment project from the parks that maybe got lost in time you want to bring up? Well, there are certainly a, a, a lot of stories about things that happen. Um, and I know as soon as, uh, as we're done here, or I think of what you're asking, but I can't think <laughs> of it at the moment. But, um, you know, we, um, I, I have to say I was very, very fortunate because uh, the company at that time, and I don't know what it is now. Of course, I haven't been in the inner workings of the company in a long time. Mm-hmm. Back then, the company was in a huge expansion mode, um, and it was blowing, you know, just throwing every which way, uh, yeah. not only in, in uh, the theme parks, but even with film when they started Touchstone and got away from, you know, the first non-Disney Disney movies, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and... and, and and, and the, the people involved um, at all levels were just absolutely wonderful and dedicated, uh, hardworking, and uh, you know it was a it was a great experience being a part of the whole the whole effort. And the um, and if we would go and make a case for a particular show or new concept that we wanted to do, um, they would, uh, you know, that they would say, okay, here's the money, go do it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's a very rare happening in a lot of organizations, you know, uh, particularly in the, in the world of, uh, of theme parks. Yeah. Um, so it, it was a, a wonderful challenge. And, uh, you know, like I said, I was, I was certainly... Uh, proud to have been a part of everything that everybody was involved with in those days. And I say everybody because, you know, there were so many talented people in that company. I mean, so many. And, mm-hmm. you know, all I said, we well, don't, you don't tell anybody your credits because 
you know, the person you're talking to has many more than you do. <laughs> 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 um, it, 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 it was a, a great opportunity and a great time in a particular company. I know that all changed a great deal when Eisner came in and became much more corporate and, uh, mm-hmm. and, it, it, and, and, and it changed quite a bit. Um, so, Ron, I, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time uh, to talk with me and, and uh, with our listeners, for that matter. I know uh, I really appreciate it. I'm sure they did as well. And um, if we want to find you online, it's miziker.com. That's correct. Yep. Okay, and I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. So, again, Ron, thank you so much for your time. Hey, it's my pleasure. Disneyland's Main Street Electrical Parade.